What yeah, do, what do you want me to look? Okay. Yeah, right. talk to me normally. And um, can I get you to tell me your name, where you live, and what you do? I'm James Howard Gray. I'm a physician, and I live in Dallas. Okay. Where were you born? I was born in Kaufman, Texas. And uh, did you grow up there? Did you... No, we moved from Kaufman to Dallas in 49. I was born in 1943, so... I don't remember much about Kaufman. I lived most of my life in Dallas. So we moved here when I was three. And where have you lived outside Dallas? Did you go to school elsewhere? Or? I went to uh, North Texas State uh, in Denton in the early 60s. Uh, went to medical school in San Antonio. Then went into the Army. Uh, was stationed at Walter Reed for three years. And then went to Baltimore where I did my residency at Johns Hopkins. And then we came back to Dallas. And so what all kinds of medicine do you do? I'm an ophthalmologist. I did my uh, medical training at San Antonio and did an internship in internal medicine there at Barrow County Hospital. And following Barrow County Hospital internship, I uh, went into the Army. At that time, we still had the draft, and I had a military deferment while in medical school. So at the completion of my medical school training, uh, I was obligated to go into the Army, and uh, I was stationed at Walter Reed along with my wife uh, from 72 to 75. And while in the Army, I was a uh, general medical officer at Walter Reed and had some coverage at the Pentagon. There's an emergency room at the Pentagon that I covered, and for one year there, I was in charge of the emergency room at Walter Reed. And after that, I went to my residency at Johns Hopkins, and from 75 to 78, I was in Baltimore, Maryland, <coughs> at the Wilma Eye Hospital. Did I hear um, correctly that you told the story about 9-11 when you gave a, a commencement speech, or was that? No, I didn't hear a story about 9-11. Uh, I made a comment about uh, my being uh, in North Texas when uh, I journeyed back to Dallas in 63 for, uh, when President Kennedy was assassinated. Right. Uh, I just thought that you had been working up there or something. No, I was still in, I was still in Dallas at 9-11. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you tell me about Dallas and like, how Dallas has changed in your lifetime? What seems different and what seems, seems the same? There's been a lot of change in Dallas. Uh, when I left Dallas in 61, when I finished high school at Lincoln High School and left in 61, I was just starting to learn to drive. And so there were large parts of Dallas that I hadn't really uh, traveled over. And uh, it built up a lot while I was away. And then when I came back, I was driving. And some of the highways that were not here when I left uh, were here when I came back. Uh, 635, a beltway, that was not here. Uh, Town East Boulevard. Uh, County Mall, that whole development wasn't here. Valley View Mall was being uh, erected uh, back in the early 60s. I used to work at Cereals on Ross Avenue and I used to uh, drive a truck taking uh, tires to the Valley View Cereals. And during that time, that was about the only thing that was out there was the Cereals. And now the whole 635 corridor has been built up. Uh, my father and mother were school teachers, and my father was principal of a school in Mesquite called George Washington Carver, which was uh, on the corner of uh, Syene and uh, basically what is now 635. But in those days, it was no 635, so you take Syene all the way in from Dallas to Mesquite. And uh, now where the school used to be is uh, IHOP at that same location. Uh, not only Dallas has been uh, built up, but all the surrounding areas have changed. Mesquite was like a, a sort of a forming community back in the 50s and 60s. Now it's uh, metropolitan. It only had one high school. And the only thing that you could see going down Syene to Mesquite from Dallas was the Mesquite Rodeo. That has stayed the same. Now Mesquite is a booming metropolitan area. Uh, 
back in the 50s and 60s, the flying red horse you could see coming from uh, South Texas, coming into Dallas. Uh, the skyscrapers were not so uh, overpowering such that you could not see the Magnolia, Magnolia Building and the Flying Red Horse. When I came back, most of uh, the skyscrapers had pretty much surrounded the Flying Red Horse, where you really have to stir and search to find it. Uh, the Southland Building was about the tallest building uh, when I left. The Mercantile National Bank was, I can remember when that was the tallest building in Dallas. Then you had the Republic National Bank and then the Interfirst Bank and that something that became uh, uh, Bank of America. So a lot of things changed downtown. The skyscrapers, of course, uh, the theaters. Uh, back in the 50s and 60s, you had several uh, large theaters downtown Dallas. The Tower, the Majestic, the Palace. Those subsequently went uh, the way of the Buffalo and had a lot of the outlying uh, movie theaters to come up. Uh, the Metroplex, where you had more than one screen. So all of that is new. Uh, Central Expressway was uh, here back when I lived in Dallas before leaving and uh, all that's happened to it, it became more and more congested but when I came back to Dallas shortly after that they started building and, and, uh, and widening the Central Expressway so that doesn't even look like the old Central Expressway anymore. What about Dallas as a community? Did you notice a big change over the years? Uh, well, we initially lived in West Dallas when we moved from uh, Kaufman to Dallas, it was West Dallas, and we stayed on West Moreland. And uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, West Dallas was was like a rural part of Dallas. It was not well developed, and uh, we used to actually have cows and chickens in West Dallas, outdoor uh, tortoise within West Dallas. Uh, that has changed. Uh, South Dallas has changed, where I grew up for most of my life, but even in South Dallas in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, it may have been a city against a city ordinance, I don't know, but we had uh, chickens in South Dallas, and I used to sell the eggs on my paper route. I used to throw the Dallas Morning News, and my mother would ask us to take eggs around to some of the customers there that had requested it. Uh, my father had some land in South Texas, close to Palestine, in a place called Yard, Texas, and uh, he still had cows on that land, and we would bring up uh, what he called runts uh, to Dallas, and we basically fed calves in the backyard with a milk bottle until they got up to some size, and then we took them back to close to Palestine. We've had uh, uh, small pigs that were runts and fed them by bottle until they got up to some size and took them back. So. It was a different uh, climate. It was, uh, I'm pretty sure now you cannot have pigs and calves in the city of Dallas, but at that time we did have, and like we had chickens as well. And uh, you used to play in the street, and uh, your mother would come outside on the porch and holler for you to come inside at a certain time, and we'd come inside, we'd play hide and go seek right in the street, the street lights would be on, and that would be our playground. And uh, the climate is different now because most parents would be concerned about the safety of the children if they were playing at 8 or 9 o'clock at night just out on the street. But they could go in and, and not have too much concern because it was a community. The uh, families that lived along up and down the street where I grew up, we all knew each other. They were all homeowners and they took a lot of pride in their homes and it was just a different type of uh, situation. Uh, they were more likely to have uh, not a single parent type family. Fathers and mothers were still together. They were raising the children as a unit. And uh, it was not to say that there were not negative things. We still had uh, difficulties with the racial situation as it existed all across the United States at that time. And that was something to deal with. But uh, that was only a problem if you. Uh, allowed it to become a problem. There was so much happiness and so much uh, love in the community that most of the time you just pass it off and, and uh, dwell on the positive. And I think that's what, and I like to think that that was the reality of it and not just my faulty memory and trying to bring back memories that were not there. But I think in 
I think I'm being accurate in saying that that's the way it was. Our Christmases were different. Uh, now it seems as if everyone has to have a lot of toys and to take part in a lot of uh, extraneous things. Uh, Christmases I can remember in the 50s and 60s uh, would mean very simple type of Christmases. We would get an old pile in the back of the car. My father would take us over to the city and we'd just look at Christmas decoration. We'd go downtown and it wasn't just uh, small black families in the 50s and 60s. Other families were doing the same thing. They would drive to down Lamar. There was old Santa Claus that was out in front of the Sears uh, store in Lamar that used to lean over and wave at you as you pass by. Uh, a big mannequin. And I can remember going, being driven by that Santa Claus every year for several years. We drive down the streets of Dallas, downtown Dallas, and see the decoration. And we felt very good about that. There was no money spent just driving around looking at decoration and come back home. Uh, more than likely, the tree that we'd get for Christmas would be a tree that my father would chop down and bring home. And we put a, a pedestal, a, a base on it, and we would decorate it ourselves, and sometimes with homemade decoration. And it was just, a, it was a simpler time, but it was, a, I think, a truer time. Uh, people's feelings were what they were, and, and to a large degree, you didn't have to continually look over your shoulders expecting an enemy because probably there were no enemies. You, you would find a friend. It was a, a very, uh, I think, good time to, to grow up. Um, did you know anything about Chibi Daily growing up at Dewey Plaza's in Mecca? I don't remember anything about Dewey. You heard, Dewey anything, Dewey. heard anything about him since then? I mean, did you ever, people ever talk about him? No. No. Uh, did you know? Uh, I've heard, heard about uh, uh, the hunts, and uh, I think I was, was interested about them. I read where uh, the patriarch raised his sons to uh, take their lunches to work in a brown bag, and that was to teach them uh, a certain amount of, of respect for, for common and simple things. And you would think that someone as wealthy as a hunt would have to have a full course meal and and uh, I've always felt that was uh, very interesting, that they would carry that bag to work. Um, had you been down at Dealey Plaza as a common thing, or was when you were young, or was that not a part of the town that you went to? Uh, Dealey Plaza was not an area that we would be normally going by. Most of our trips to Dallas we're going to movie theaters, uh, shopping at some of the stores. Some of the stores in the 50s, uh, blacks were not allowed to try on clothes. And, and so uh, some of the things that we uh, chose to do or we had opportunities to do were sort of orchestrated things that we had little control over anyway. Uh, we, but that wasn't, uh, it wasn't necessary that we duplicated and did what others did to to enjoy ourselves and find some some warmth and positive uh, things about what what we were doing, uh, it has never been you haven't done anything unless you've done this, uh, or you haven't gone anywhere unless you've gone here. Uh, we have found that uh, you carry your world with you, and and our parents were from a very simple small town, and uh, we grew up with a lot of their small town values. So we've, we've never been impressed with, uh, with the glitz of anything. Can you uh, tell me what you thought of Kennedy as president at the time? I thought Kennedy was a great president. Uh, I was the uh, president of our student body during the time that Kennedy was being inaugurated. and. And uh, I, in fact, tried to mimic some of his mannerism. I respected him, thought so much of him because his speeches were very well done. And I think the whole country liked him because he represented uh, the vibrancy of the country. Uh, he was uh, a young president. He seemed to have a lot of energy. And uh, there's something that a lot of people have never quite vocalized that I think is true it, it was true then, it's just as it's still true. The fact that we dealt with uh, uh, racial injustices and other problems, 
I don't think that the average American really bought into that. They just may not have spoken up, but they were not in favor of it. Sometimes they just turned away. And I think that's something that uh, I've never heard said a lot or enough. Uh, you make an assumption that everybody in the 50s and everybody in the 60s were uh, racially intolerant or they had this type of problem or they automatically hate it. You had some people that felt that way and had those type of uh, ideas. But I think for the large uh, part, Americans have always been fair. They just may not have had to live to see it and they haven't lived close enough to other racial groups that they basically just kind of put it out of their minds and, and unless they're confronted with it, they didn't really uh, be bothered with it, so to speak. And I think that uh, if given a choice or if asked to vote on it, I think most Americans would see down fairness as some of the things that, that were going on. In fact, I think that was the reason the civil rights movement was so successful so rapidly because I think it, it basically brought some things to the forefront that a lot of people felt uncomfortable with. And I think for the average American, they were glad to, to, to see a change because I don't think that they could sit in their churches and their places of worship every Sunday and then turn around and see the incongruity in how you are speaking love on a Sunday and on a Monday you're hating and you're mistreating people. That, that's, that's something that either your religion is in fault or, you, or what you're doing is in fault. And I think Americans have always tried to be a, a, a caring society. And I think uh, what you would see sometimes are the people who were the most vocal and outspoken may have been your haters. But I've never felt that the average American was a hater anyway. And I think that's what Kennedy uh, did. I, I think if he, if the American climate was not as good as it was, Kennedy would not have been able to do some of the things that he did, and Johnson wouldn't have been able to do some of the things that he did. Uh, they were able to change, a lot of people say the way he changed the conscience of America. The conscience was always there. All they did was just basically uh, tweak it a little so that people, they made you become as good as you could become, and I think that's what was good. We always were good people. They just uh, asked more of you. They asked you to be a good person, not just talk it, but to walk it. And I think that's the same thing that uh, people uh, recognize what Kennedy did when we had the uh, the race for space, when the Russians and the Americans were racing to see who was going to dominate space, and when uh, Yuri Gagarin went out in space first, and we thought the Russians were going to really get ahead of us. He asked all Americans to you know, locked arms, and we were going to beat the Russians. In the Cold War, Americans were standing shoulder to shoulder. We were trying to, we weren't going to let uh, that happen. We had a fear that the Soviet Union was going to bomb everybody and kill everybody. They, it was their uh, promise to dominate us. Khrushchev had said in the UN that uh, he was going to destroy Americans, and we took that to heart. And I think most Americans, whether it be black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever, we knew that the bomb wasn't going to be uniquely for Anglos is going to be for everybody, and we were part of that everybody. So I think that that uh, is what Kennedy was about. And I think that's why a lot of people mourn him so, regardless of the party. Because I think if you stopped and looked at what he was asking, he was asking for you to continue f fulfilling the dream that Americans have always had. Whether or not you're an immigrant from Italy or whether or not you came over on a slave ship, most of the people who come to this country have a feeling that they can be as big as they attempt to be. You're not being restrained by uh, your place in birth, and to a degree, as African Americans, obviously we were, but it was still in the process of changing that around. And in looking and seeing what was going on in other countries, I felt freer as an African American in this country than I did, than probably a lot of uh, Russians did in their own country. And I think that uh, Kennedy was asking for the best in people, and I think that came across. A lot of people didn't like him, and they didn't like the fact that he was wealthy, the fact that he was handsome, the fact that he was from the East, but when, when you saw what he did, when you saw that this young guy uh, served in World War II, and he was very wealthy, and he could have gotten out of it, but he didn't, and he almost got himself killed in World War II, and you saw what the family was about, and that, that they didn't tolerate intolerance, when he could remember uh, how the Irish were treated in this country, and he realized, and Kennedy was a very bright person, and he realized that uh, all you do is change your name, 
a change your skin color or change your eye color or change just a little and then all of a sudden you're an outsider. He realized the ridiculousness of that. And, uh, and I think that one of the main things I like about him is I think he was the first president to really do good things because it was the right thing. Some people did it because it was politically expedient. Uh, I give credit to Harry Truman. Harry Truman was uh, somewhat uh, of a bigot in his upbringing, but Harry Truman was also a very, very bright man, and he came to realize how things were not fair and how you cannot have a country divided, and so he integrated the armed services. And uh, I think Harry Truman was one of the greatest presidents we've had, and he had to deal with a lot of things that uh, he came full circle. He put his, some of his maybe racial ideas that he, he, he probably had a little touch of it, but by the time he finished being president, Harry Truman was the president for everybody. John Kennedy uh, did some things and got in harm's way because he was doing what was right. And, I, and he came to be a president where you could look at him and listen to what he was saying and realize that he's not saying this to get votes. In fact, sometimes it cost him votes. But he did it because he felt that it was the right thing to do. I think as a person and, and as a president, he could probably wake up every morning and look himself in the mirror and say, I have done right. And whether or not uh, everybody liked it or not, it was the right thing to do. He said something once that I'll never forget. He said that, how would uh, you expect or like to live as an African American if you went to the military, served your country, and did all of these things were in harm's way, and then come over and be mistreated just because of something that you have no control over? And in fact, it should not be anything you apologize for. I, I have uh, Kennedy should be proud of who his ancestors were. I should be proud of who my ancestors were. I, I owe no one an apology, and he didn't ask for, uh, he didn't address African Americans as if you have to apologize for being here. He respected you, and I think that respect went across the board. I think it wasn't, a lot of people associate Kennedy with, with the civil rights movement and African Americans. I think most minorities and ethnic group uh, liked Kennedy because they felt that what he was saying may be unique at that situation for African Americans, but it, it transcends African Americans, it transcends uh, uh, religions, it was for everybody. If it's fair for them, it's fair for everybody. He's basically saying, if you would not want to be treated that way, we will not tolerate anyone else being treated that way. If you cannot ask this man to risk his life for a country and then come back and be mistreated in his own country. And I think it saddened him that some of the African American soldiers chose to stay away rather than come back to this country. Because he said, well, what does this say about our country? When other countries would criticize us, he said, how can you speak to us about tolerance and fairness and you have uh, a history of slavery? He was, a, he was a, a great historian and he could see the incongruity in that. And he, his, his approach was, we are not perfect, but we are trying to do what is right. And I think other countries saw, and in fact, we're still a work in progress even now as a country. We're not, we're not perfect, but I have uh, been in other countries and lived there and talked with other citizens. I lived in Iran for several months while I was at Johns Hopkins, and in talking to some of the Iranian students, it was their goal to be like America. Say, we want freedom like you have freedom. And that was 20 years ago. They were wanting freedom well, 25 years ago, they were wanting freedom like we want. And I think that that's something that we as a country can be very proud of because we have done more for human dignity and human rights, and we've only been around for a few hundred years. But yet we've done more to, to make other humans treat each other right probably than any other country. Um, from Alexander Grace days to Egyptian days, were all, it was always a, a, a war, a domination, and it wasn't a lot of uh, Martin Luther Kings or President Kennedy trying to get people to live together and respect each other. It was uh, the sword. If I can kill you and I can take your land, I kill you and take your land. And uh, I, I feel very proud that this country has done what it has done in the few years that we've been here. So I think Kennedy represented that. I mean, people were glad to uh, 
to uh, look at him as a president, and when sometimes his his weaknesses or his uh, imperfections came to the forefront, that's why people would look the other way because they said, "No one is perfect. We want to look at him as the good things he did, because his the, the good things he did far outweighed uh, any little negative stuff that he had. He was not perfect. No one's perfect, but his heart was in the right place, and I would think nothing about uh, going to war with somebody like that. I would want someone like that. If I was in a foxhole, and I would rather have a Kennedy in a foxhole than someone who I could turn around and they'd be out trying to save themselves. Because everybody came away with the feeling that this man wasn't going to leave you. He was going to be there for you. And he showed that in World War II. He was, uh, and as, a, as an African American in the 60s and some of the things I was facing, uh, Kennedy's Life and his subsequent death was a very uh, painful experience for me because I looked at Kennedy as a as a as a light. It was very difficult going through to dealing with the bigotries and the hatreds and 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 even then I understood that people were basically a reflection of how they were raised. Uh, if I wanted to go and start criticizing a person my age for acting hateful toward me in the 50s or 60s, I really need to get his father and mother or his whole community because he's just basically a reflection of how he was produced. I already realized that. Uh, my parents were school teachers and they raised us in a very uh, fair type of environment and certain things they would not tolerate. They did not tolerate uh, racial intolerance. They did not tolerate uh, uh, age intolerance. We were riding once in a car with my daddy and uh, I guess we were about eight or nine and we saw this elderly man on crutches and he was trying to make it down the street and I don't know who in the back seat started giggling and thought that was funny and my father stopped that and said that all you have to do is to be elderly and have trouble walking is to keep living and one day you'll be elderly. They didn't tolerate intolerance and they made you, uh, they, they strive for you to be better than what your innate uh, type of uh, id reaction. He said, you, you are, you're better than that. You can, you can think this thing through and see this. You don't have to mimic ignorance. We're not raising you to, with all of this knowledge and sending you to school, to then turn around and, and, and parrot ignorance. And I think that uh, in, in uh, Kennedy's subsequent death, I saw it like a flame that was there Maybe we wanted, a lot of people were following and a lot of people were looking and seeing his, his ideas. And he was speaking just as if he were African American himself. What he was saying was the same thing we had been saying for the longest. I have a brother who had served in the Korean conflict. Uh, then he served in the Vietnam conflict. I had two brothers in Vietnam at the same time. One was a colonel, the other retired lieutenant colonel. Uh, they served their countries for 20 years, retired military. So, and I was in the military for three years. Uh, all of my brothers were in the military. I had five brothers. And for us to all, when the draft came, no one ran, we, to us, to, and I joined, to go into the military, serve our country. Uh, none of us have been in jail. We have done nothing but, but love this country, support this country. Uh, all of us are still married. We, we have all taken care of our families. So it is ridiculous for someone to, to make an assessment of me by looking at me and my skin color and then making a determination that he must be a this or he must be a that. That is as ridiculous as if I tried to, to hate a tree or hate a cloud or hate a, any other uh, natural uh, organic body on this earth. That's foolish. And my parents led us to realize that was foolish years and years ago. Uh, the first time everyone ever made a racial epithet toward me, I didn't even know what to set back because I didn't even know any racial epithets to throw back at them. When I came back home and told my parents what the person said, they just said, that's just ignorance, don't worry about it. They didn't give me a word to call this person back again. And it wasn't until I was in, almost in high school, 
by to go to college that I started learning some of the things that you can say back. All during the time I lived in my parents' home, that wasn't ever said. I mean, uh, you, you could not call anyone uh, out of that name or, or make little of their race. That's crazy. He said, this person didn't ask you your permission to exist. He has a right to exist like you have a right to exist. This is crazy. This is foolish. That's, like I said, it's like hating a tree or hating a cloud or hating water or hating the grass. It is that it is. They have a right to exist. You have a right to exist. You respect them. They respect you. And that's how we were raised. Uh, and, and I made that comment to some other people that I never knew anything what to call a person back. And they said, well, you didn't know to say this and you didn't know that. And, and they could not believe. I said, no, you don't quite understand. Uh, we weren't raised that way. My parents didn't raise us to hate anybody. Uh, they're going to take us to church every Sunday. And uh, we're going to... Uh, and my father's having dealing with uh, superintendent of school in Mesquite and he's carrying me around to different places. That's crazy for me to be talking to some people who look different to me and in the next minute hate them. That was, that, was, that, was, that was crazy. And he didn't carry himself that way, my mother didn't carry him that way. And Kennedy was like saying, we are going to change, this is how things are going to be, we're going to love one another. And if you don't love, at least we're going to respect each other. We're going to realize this person has a reason to exist at least and we're going to uh, bring everyone as a part of the American dream. Then when someone assassinated him, it was like, okay, here we go back to square one. The teacher has been killed, and now the lesson has to be learned all over again. Now who's going to take uh, Kennedy, where Kennedy left off? And when we saw the funeral on TV, and we saw the number of people who were crying, and they, the, how the whole country was just uh, broken hearted. Then I came to realize that it, it wasn't dead. Uh, everybody that I saw, and that I can remember, you probably still had people who were hating and glad that they killed him because they didn't like him and all. But I think I can never forget seeing that uh, horse without a rider, uh, little John John uh, saluting him, and just. The people were so uh, tearful. Uh, I was shedding tears among other racial groups shedding tears. And that always felt good. It was a, they, they hurt has transcended race and anything else. It's just you have hurt us as a people. And that's what I saw. And I think that was, so I, I at first thought that his death was going to change a lot. And I think even now, he would be proud to look back and say, progress is still going on. It has been a little slow, but it's still going on. We're not going back to uh, Jim Crow laws and poll taxes and all this kind of stuff. And it's interesting to see how people seem amazed that these things could happen. And I think their amazement is good. It's always good when people are shocked and they just say, I can't understand. I can't. Well, I was there. I saw it. And it was going on. But that, that lets me know also, too, what I said earlier, is that even though a lot of people may not have come to the forefront to say anything about it, they didn't necessarily like it. It just takes a lot of courage to, to go against the grain. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of, uh, of Anglo and uh, Jewish and Hispanic and Asian people who were out there on the forefront for civil rights too. Uh, some of the Jewish people lost their lives trying to get people just to register to vote and they paid the supreme price. So it is ludicrous for anyone to try to, to not accept and understand that everybody had a place in this. Some of the same laws were passed that, that were thought for African Americans. Those laws have now been applied to everyone who is disenfranchised or who been mistreated. Whether it's gays, it's taken a long time for these laws to be changed then, but, it, but it's there. Whether or not it's, it's a working force and how women are treated, that's been positive. Those same civil rights and human rights type of actions have come to protect everyone. And uh, all you have to do to be in a position of, of weakness is to have a misfortune of, of uh, developing a mental illness. And some of the laws may even help you. 
uh, wealth is no protection against being mentally ill. So if a person is mentally ill and he develops a, 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 a homeless type situation, some of the same laws that were there initially back in the 50s and 60s that tried to help African Americans, they may help someone Anglo. So no one is putting you in jail, no one's mistreating you. You have to treat with respect. Because the thing, all is said and done, it never was about uh, race, it was always just about respect. It was about, uh, like Kennedy said, put yourself in that person's shoes. And if, it's, if you would not like to be treated that way, why do you assume someone else would be treated that way? When I, uh, I have uh, visited a number of countries, I've been in uh, China, in Singapore, uh, in Rome, in, in uh, Germany several times, and and Iran. Iran was the most unwestern country I've ever lived in. And I found it very little different. When you got down right to the bottom of it, it was still the same thing. People were wanting to be treated with respect. They wanted to have a certain amount of decency. They loved their family. The Iranian families loved each other just as much as the American families did. I went on on picnics with families in Iran. Uh, I have uh, eaten with them in their homes. I have uh, hugged them, they have hugged me when I, it was time for me to leave the country. And I came to realize that it's really not any difference at all. You love your family, I love my family. Uh, you love your country, I love my country. Uh, you want the freedom that we may have in this country and you sometimes are amazed that we cannot appreciate our own freedom. You would give anything to have the type of freedom. And you sometimes may seem resentful that we seem to take it for granted. And I realize that. In living in that country for a few months, I realized how some of the resentment was that how can you people not appreciate what you have? And I think a lot of Americans would do well to live in, say, a third world country and understand just what they have here. Some things we take for granted, running water, uh, your trash being picked up without having to pay someone a bribe to get your trash picked up to attach a gas line to your stove every day before you can cook breakfast. A canister of gas has to be attached before you can do that. Uh, all of those things I think we take for granted. And uh, I just think my parents raised my sisters and brothers and I in uh, such a, I mean, in such a way that we were never too far from a rural type way of looking at things anyway, and so I think we came to appreciate everything. I remember a little black and white TV, and now we have a large screen color TV. But I can still remember that there was once a black and white TV that I used to look at and would be enthralled at, and it didn't, it didn't have to be everything for me to see the wonder in it and to see the, the joyfulness in it, so, and I think that's what they gave me. Can you tell me about November 22nd, 1963, what you did on that day? And yeah, that, that was, uh, I was living in Denton, I was a junior, I was living, going to the University of North Texas, it was then called North Texas State University, and uh, my roommate and I, O.C. Hammond is my roommate, we went in his car and uh, came back to Dallas, he's from Dallas as well, and we came to uh, take part in the Kennedy arrival in Dallas and the motorcade. So we uh, it's okay. It's okay. Yes. Uh, Jacqueline, I'm being interviewed here on TV. Don't uh, just ask Carol, because I have to interrupt this to, to answer the phone. Don't have anybody else to call. All right. So we uh, we drove to Dallas, and uh, we parked on the Stimmons Freeway right off the shoulder, and we said we would just simply walk down to the front of the motorcade, and that way, when we the, when it was finished, we could just get right back in the car and drive right back to Denton. Stimmons is, uh, of course, 35 uh, south, and uh, 
that we did. We got out of it. We parked the car on the grass from Stimmers, and then we just walked down town Dallas. And uh, we, when we arrived, it was already a number of people already alongside uh, either side of the street. Uh, the schools had been let out to uh, watch the motorcade, and everyone was very, very happy. It was like a carnival setting. Uh, I have read where people said that uh, that Dallas did this to Kennedy and that Dallas is a city of hate, and all. And I've always felt that that was so wrong because the city, Dallas has a reputation for being conservative, but Dallas uh, turned out for John Kennedy. And you didn't have any placards or signs talking about Kennedy go home. You had people just uh, with smiles on their face, uh, just like you were at the State Fair. We were uh, blacks, white, Hispanics, everyone we were smiling and happy and it was just a bustling in the crowd because we were waiting for the motorcade to come through. Uh, on either side of the street, I can just remember it being around noon, it was not, even though it was in November, it really wasn't that cold. It was uh, probably just more like fall no, I don't know exactly what the temperature was, but it wasn't uncomfortable at all. And I don't know if it was just because there's so many people all crowded together, but it was just a very pleasant. Uh, the temperature and the weather was nice. Uh, the motorcade was coming through a little faster than what I had anticipated. I thought it would be just kind of snaking through two or three miles per hour. It was going faster than that. So you found your spot and you kind of held on to that spot. If you could look between people's shoulders, you did that. We got it, my roommate and I, we were actually out right on the curb, so we were we were able to see it. And they passed through at such a speed that we were thinking that the first uh, limousine coming through was uh, their limousine. It really wasn't. So when we, uh, when we finally saw them, I saw Jack who was waving on either side. I saw President Kennedy waving and it was probably no more than uh, two or three seconds, and they were gone. And so then we started, uh, we waited until all the other cars had gone through, and then we started walking toward our car, which was back on Stimmons. We had come uh, downtown to see it, and then we started walking in the same direction that they were going. We got about, oh, a block and a half, two blocks down the street, and it was a a milk truck, a guy in a milk truck that had the open doors there, and uh, he was saying that we heard, and by that time we heard just a lot of commotion, and at first we thought it was just uh, the people down further had just been a little more exuberant than we had, and that was my first thing, you know, because I knew they were making a lot more noise, and uh, then the we saw people running, and then, so we started running, and so the, uh, the guy in the milk truck said that, that there's some shooting that somebody was shooting. So then we just really took off running. And by the time we got to the uh, scuba depository, there were policemen who were encircling the scuba depository. We had policemen with rifles were kind of going around it. So I thought people were joking until I saw that the policemen were there. And I realized that everybody was running and it was in pandemonium. And I realized from, from everything, I said, you know, this something really did happen. But it wasn't until I really, I just kind of kept it in the back of my mind, so, oh, this guy's joking and all, and, and maybe someone's playing a trick. But then when I got there and saw how everything was just, uh, people were hollering and running, and then when I saw the police with the rifle, I said, they really did. Somebody was shooting here. I didn't know that they shot the president. All I knew was that somebody had shot, because it's what the person had said. Uh, when we got back in to the car and turned the radio on and drove driving back to Denton, then we heard on the radio that the president had been shot and he was then taken to Parkland and we, uh, I think by the time we got to Denton, because uh, we, I think by the end we had known that the president had been mortally wounded. And uh, so it was just a very depressing time because I felt we, we lost the president uh, I, I kind of lost a, a, a hero because Kennedy had always been like my hero and a champion because I've always liked to be there for the underman, the underdog, and, and Kennedy was was 
there for the underdog. Uh, he seems to have been the, the, the typical knight in shining armor. He was the typical uh, American hero. I grew up with comic books and Superman and Batman and always knew that if there was a real live superhero, it would probably be Kennedy because some of the stuff he did in World War II and he's there for under man, for the underdog, he was there for the little guy. And I, and when that happened, I said, goodness, this is, I said, and I was, I hated it. And I was in the back of my mind, knowing what Kennedy stood for, I was hoping that whatever happened had nothing to do with someone hurting him because of his racial stance and all, because I said, you know, if this, if, if, if we really have people hating him enough because of this and go and take his life, just because he tried to do what's right. And then when we found out that there was Lee Harvey Oswald and didn't seem to have anything to do with race and anything else, it had more to do with uh, his political uh, communist views, then that made it at least a little less painful. And I think that if Kennedy had been alive, he probably would have said, well, it, it, at least it's, this won't fragment the country any more than it is because we already have a a battle with the Soviet Union, and if this man has been brainwashed or whatever to hurt me and do this to me, at least this is something that he's brought into the country from somewhere else. This is not America. And even though later on uh, we had uh, Martin Luther King's assassination, which was, was definitely was racial, it still was not like this is uh, this is America. I think Kennedy was 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 trying to get the best out of us. And I think that the, I think the best did eventually come forth. We saw the, uh, the pathology that may exist in any country, and we saw the people with uh, weak personality uh, strengths and um, their inhibitions and their other problems that caused them to act out and do these things. But that wasn't typical American. A lot of times Americans, I think, will, they tighten up the belt they they take it on the chin, but they go and get the job done. I don't think that we, I don't think we do a lot of blaming other people. World War II showed you, I think, what, what Americans are more about than anything else. We went over and we kind of took care of business, and we, then we came back home. And I've often thought that a lot of countries, when you realize the wealth that this country has, and how everyone is used to running water, and we're used to so much luxury. For us to have, for us to produce soldiers that will leave all of that luxury, go over to some god awful country where you have parasites and you name it, out of this type of society, to go over there and risk his life and get killed and bleed to death in some foreign country. I've always thought that was, uh, that was show more of the American spirit than anything else, because there's a lot of countries that don't nearly have our wealth or whatever, but they're too good to get their hands dirty, they're too good to do this, and they're too polite. Americans, when it's necessary, we aren't too polite. We'll roll up our sleeves and we get the job done. We'll do what is necessary to, to get it done. And then we come back and we try to fall right back into our watching TVs and we are more in the yard and all, but we know how to to come forth when it's necessary to come forth. And I think uh, for a lot of the trouble we have, and right, even now, some of the other countries may try to run us down and say this and that and other. They can do all the talking, do everything they want to say, but they cannot do anything about the underpinning of this country. They know that if you try to come in here to do something to America, you have really made a mistake because we are not going to have to ask for other countries to help us out. We will take care of you, and we will do everything we can to get, get you off our soil. And probably until the last man's gone, we're going to be trying to get you off our soil. I don't think we're going to acquiesce to any foreign power coming in and taking our country. And, and, to, and to say that and believe that in a country just as young as we are, I, that makes me feel very proud of this country. And I think Kennedy, if he were here and could look back and see, I think he would be proud of what has happened. It hadn't been all smooth sailing, but... He was at a, a president at a time where we were almost threatened with nuclear war, and we're still here as a country. No uh, nuclear power has destroyed us. We, we won out in the Cold War, and our citizens, even though some of us are homeless and some of us are poor, we still have a better lifestyle than probably any country, 
uh, on the face of the earth, and we're doing it the right way. We don't, we're not a Saudi Arabia where we just bind and bind and have a monarchy. We actually open it up for vote. I mean, we're doing it in a democratic society. We're doing it as it should be done. And yet we still have everyone with a chance, at least, to try to, to, to be a part of the American dream. And those people who are not a part, right now we are hassling over it, we're trying to make it fair still. We're still a work in progress. And you know, think about it, countries that have been around for thousands of years were fighting. Uh, Alexander the Great were fighting these countries. They were empires. And now to look at them, you would think that they would be so much further ahead of us in far as how they treat their citizens, and they are not even anywhere close to us as how they treat our citizens. In time of Alexander the Great, four and five hundred years B.C., we didn't have a country. And there were other countries that were empires. Uh, the Persians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans came and went. All of these great countries and civilizations, and yet they're looking at us for, for guidance. In Africa right now, they're looking, they said, that, okay, will America come over and try to help us out? They know that in any country in the whole world, if they have a chance of, of getting it right, it'll probably be Americans that'll get it right. And that caused resentment with other countries, and they may not particularly care about that. But that's the truth of the matter, and, 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 and as American as I am, I said, if they don't like that, then they pay the price that Americans have paid to be looked at that way. A lot of our guys didn't make it back on World War II. We, we paid a price for our position. It wasn't given to us. So I don't have a problem with a country if they don't like us. Because it wasn't like we uh, were given uh, being number one on the block. We earned that. And, and even still, we, we're fighting people and we're helping them at the same time. I mean, no other countries do that. In World War II, we had uh, the Germans were saying that you, if you be captured, you want to be captured by the Americans. Why would they say that? Because Americans, uh, we weren't going to be automatically killing and torturing people. They, some of the German soldiers admitted that they ate better as prisoners of war by Americans than they ate in their own army. And why would they do that? I think, so I think all said and done, no, we're not perfect, but we have done, this country has a lot to be thankful for, and we have a lot to be proud for, and we don't have to be turning our backs and looking, uh, apologizing to any country, because every country out there has had something to, that has not been all that great, and uh, and all of them would, would like to probably trade places uh, with us as far as our prestige. Some of the resentment they have is because of our military power and our wealth, but even so, we are a country of of the same thing that made us great was the American spirit. It says, come over, give it your best shot. Let's see what you have to offer. And we'll look at it. I mean, the person who invented the, the traffic light, that was a black person. And they didn't say the traffic light not going to work because this person was black. If it worked, fine, we'll go with it. And, and I think uh, other countries are trying to keep people down by certain, in the Soviet Union in those times, they were saying if you had an IQ of this, then you're automatically going to be a janitor, or you're automatically going to do that. In America, it wasn't that way. It's nothing automatic. You can have an IQ of 75. If you work hard enough and you build your business, you could be a millionaire too. Nobody was going to keep you down because of your IQ or whatever. And, and, and the Soviet Union, that was, they were doing it. And I think that's one of the reasons why we as a country are as great as we are, because we allow everybody, we, we sit back and look at every idea you may have. If it comes from a female, if she knows what she's talking about, so be it. If it comes from somebody with no legs, so be it. Your idea is your idea. And we have, from the TV set, from, uh, from uh, telephones to airplanes to automobiles, you name it, we have always been out there trying to build a better mousetrap. And if other countries were so busy, uh, trying to keep each other down or squabbling with each, each other. We had our squabble in the Civil, in, in the, uh, uh, civil War. That was our biggest squabble. And it's over. That was our squabble and it's over. We left it alone. Other countries are the size of Texas, and they'd be fighting on and on and on and on for hundreds and hundreds of years. We fight, we finish, and then we go on about 
what this country because we I think we all have a very deep and abiding faith in the country we all we don't want this country to be divided up we wanted it the United States that's something that said we 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 may board Oklahoma and we don't want them to beat us in football but they are Americans and that is something that uh, I think a lot of countries would look at at each other in the way that we look at each other I think that that would they would have been more competition uh, I'm obviously very pro-American, but 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 that's that's the way I feel. Um, you mentioned how some people wanted to blame Dallas for what happened, and I'm, I've heard from other people they had a lot of they encountered a lot of negative feelings from people about Dallas. What do you think helped to improve Dallas's image or make people feel better about Dallas again? Was it just time, or were there specific things that? But the interesting thing about Dallas is that. I mean, this may sound a typical Texan, and if, it's, if, if it does, it just does. But to be frank with you, I don't think Dallas cared. Dallas is, uh, Dallas knew they did not kill President Kennedy. and didn't know that Lee Harvey Oswald wasn't here. Dallas was out so busy uh, building itself and working to get ahead that it just basically kind of let that float right over it. And uh, I think most Texans are mavericks. Uh, and I think uh, Dallasites are more maverick than anybody. I mean, uh, you have had some interesting characters that come out of Dallas. And I don't really think that you had a lot of people anguishing over the fact that someone in New York or Philadelphia may think Dallas did this and Dallas did that. Uh, when I lived on the East Coast and someone would come up and make that comment, I would tell them very quickly, I said, Dallas and have anything to do with President Kennedy's assassination. Uh, there have been studies that show that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and, and people who were behind him or whatever, this was going on elsewhere. At one time, Fort Worth was going to be a site where he maybe would have assassinated him, and if that happened in Fort Worth, he wouldn't have anything to do with Fort Worth either. He wasn't uh, out of Dallas or Fort Worth to do this. He was, he was just uh, a person that came here, Kennedy just happened to be killed in Dallas, had nothing to do with Dallas. And even though in those days you had the John Burr Society that was kind of a, a power here, you had a lot of right wing people here that still didn't, it, it was a limit to how far Dallas would uh, allow certain things to go. I think underneath Dallas's conservative image, it's always been a, uh, it's always been a limit. Like some areas far in the deep south, you have seen some things and the, and the, the police look the other way and everybody look the other way. Uh, to a degree in Dallas, some people have said that the police have been allowed to do something back in the 40s and 50s and they kind of just got a slap on the hands. And There have been some very famous cases where the police may have, have uh, overstepped their bound, but it was a difference in that it was not acceptable. They kind of got outside the line and most people, it, it, it offended most people's uh, uh, ideas of themselves. So they're saying, we're conservative and we, you know, we do our own thing. But, you know, don't do that again. Whereas in parts of the Deep South, it was like it was condoned, it was winked at and, and going on. I don't think the Dallas sites are, are inherently any different than anyone else. I think Dallas sites are proud. And uh, I was once, uh, when I was in Baltimore, a person made a comment about, uh, was I going to go back to Dallas? And I said, sure, I'm going back to Dallas. And they were... I guess of the opinion that because Dallas is in Texas and and, uh, and Baltimore is a little more liberal, then I would not be going back to my home state. And I asked them, have you ever been anywhere further west than Virginia? And they said, no. And I just smiled and told them, I said, you know, you need to really travel the rest of this country. I said, there's a lot of United States on the other side of Virginia. All of the United States is not from Virginia to the Atlantic Ocean. And so go out and see Missouri, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Colorado, all these places. And I, and I told them, I have been to most of the states, so that's why I'm going to go back. I don't, I, have, I, I, I understood exactly what happened in Dallas, and I don't think Dallas had anything to apologize for. Uh, but I think that, to be honest with you, I think if one person, even if Lee Harvey had been born and raised in Dallas, and he did that like he did it, I don't think Dallasites would be 
uh, apologetic or acting uh, despondent about it. They just said, you got an idiot there. Then that's what, and that's about what they would say. So you got an idiot. They said, this, this guy's a fool. And they would have gone about their business. I don't think they would automatically, Dallas are very proud. And they're, they're, they're not arrogant, but they're proud and they are hardworking. They build the city, all of us, black, Hispanic, and everything else. They like the city. And this is why you'll see a lot of signs here where a person say they'll have New York on it. And they'll have, Dallas I will put a bump sticker and say, if you love New York, take Interstate 30. That's what they're saying. We like it here, and we're going to stay here. If you don't like it here, get out. And 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 that's where they are. And so I know I don't think they, and, and I don't think Dallas ever owed anybody an apology because that was a it was a scapegoat. The same mentality that would cause you to be bigoted and hateful is the same type of mentality that caused people trying to wrap that around Dallas' neck as if it's Dallas's fault. Dallas had nothing to do with that. And I I, I don't. I don't think that Dallas has any more, anything more to be ashamed about with that than the Washington, D.C. had to do with uh, President Kennedy, um, uh, Lincoln being assassinated. Some people don't know who, even where he, he was assassinated in the Fourth Theater, know anything about it. They've long since forgotten about that. That had nothing to do with, with, uh, with Dallas. Dallas was conservative, but Dallas didn't, didn't do that. When you like, drive by Dealey Plaza now or you're down in that area, what does it make you feel or make you think? Do you remember things? Does it still yeah, I, strike uh, you? I have uh, driven by Dealey Plaza several times. Uh, sometimes I'm going downtown to uh, go to the Reunion Arena. Sometimes going to hit 35 when I'm already downtown. And it brings back it brings back memories, but that incident is not the only thing I think about. I like to think about what would have happened if Kennedy had not been assassinated, and I stop and think about his family and what has all happened. There were so many things that changed and were put into play by this uh, uh, man's assassination that all of it saddened me. Uh, when uh, John Kennedy Jr. Uh, was killed, and I started reflecting back on all of the tragedies that's, that's occurred, and I don't really think that any of it is fair, like a lot of things in life are not fair, but it simply uh, brings me to understand the the complexities of life and how, despite your best efforts, sometimes things don't go right. And you can be a, a good person and things don't go right. So in that sense, it allows me to, to caution my children about stopping at red lights and don't speed. And because I realize that they are wonderful children, my daughter and son, but I can't protect them, and sometimes bad things happen to some of the best people. Now, here lately, you've seen the press about uh, people writing about uh, John Kennedy Jr., and they're still saying negative things about, and, and, and that's very hurtful to me because they haven't done anything criminal. It's not like they have killed anyone or done anything. These are things that they were wrestling around with in their own life, trying to to survive just as everyone else. The fact that they were wealthy and the fact that they were in the, in the limelight doesn't protect them from a depression. It doesn't uh, protect them from insecurities and a lot of other things. They were just dwelling and dealing with it the best way they can, and I just don't think it's fair. But, but I understand that too. We all want to, sometimes human nature, some of the darkest part, uh, deep in the recesses of our own psyche, we it's easy for us to congratulate and, and be happy for the person in Houston that wins the lottery. Our next door neighbor wins the lottery, then we have an attitude. You know, it just, you know, they find, you find so much negative to say when it's that close to you. That, that he didn't deserve the lottery, and then you come up with how many times he's, he cuts his jaw, or he didn't cut his jaw. Any little thing to be picky and to hurt 
And that tells more about the person than it does about anybody else. So I, I think that a lot of stuff has come out of uh, his assassination. Now, it, I think they have led their life with dignity. And I don't think that everything was necessary to be used to say anything negative about them because uh, the fact that they are in the limelight opens them up to scrutiny that other people wouldn't have to be scrutinized to that level. I think if you open up everyone's life and look at it with, with a, <coughs> a brush and pick and like, like the Kennedys have been looked at, you'll probably find a number of people that would rather not have everything disclosed. And I just think that uh, the people who, who didn't like them or who felt uh, challenged by their family or, or somehow or another insecure because of their success, they are the ones that uh, they find it, it joyful to hurt them. I have always admired them. I've always, and I think they could be poor as Tom's turkey for what they stood for and what they said. I think those things are what will be written in history books. I don't even know how much the Kennedys are worth. And few the people know that they're wealthy, but very few people can tell you how many millions of dollars they were. That's not what you read in the book. What you read about in Kennedy, uh, when you read an encyclopedia about John Kennedy, are the things that he did that had nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with him being Irish, his capitalism, being a Catholic, none of that. It has to do with things that he basically did and changed for a, a, a positive he made people become better people. And I think that's what uh, I like to look at his life and his whole family for that regard in that way because I think that's what they have been about. I, th I think that the Kennedys could have amassed more money and become a whole lot more financially stable if they had chosen to look the other way and have done what some other political families have done. They didn't do that. Uh, uh, Ted Kennedy right now is up there trying to, uh, to talk about the unfairness of the death penalty is how it relates to different ethnic groups. And it's something that is true. He's, he's, the, the statistics show that. Uh, you're more likely to be uh, receive lethal injection by being a minority than if you are not a minority. And he said it should not be that way. It should stop it until it's fair. Most people realize that. And he's just saying what should be said. And I don't care if if Ted Kennedy drinks too much or, or not drink too much, when he's not drinking too much, what he says is the truth, and it's like a, a old saying, uh, the truth is true. Uh, you know, we can have a one person say the truth and a million can tell a lie, but it doesn't change. It's still true. Truth will always win out, and eventually, I think people will come to see what he's been arguing for the longest, just as just as his brother. He has the courage to sit up and say what needs to be stated. And it's always lonely when you're doing something like that, especially when it's a lot easier for everyone to just kind of join the masses. Uh, it's, it's like a, a movie once ago, Lonely or the Brave. And I think that's very true. Lonely or the Brave. If you come up and stand for something that is, that is right, and if it is controversial, but if it's right and it goes against the grain, you are going to be a lonely person. Galileo found that out. They, they, Galileo said that uh, he felt the Copernican theory, the sun didn't revolve around the earth, the earth revolved around the sun. Well, nobody wanted to hear that. The Roman Catholic Church didn't want to hear that. And when he wrote that, they gave him a tour underground, in the underground dungeon of the church, and they didn't threaten him out and out, but they showed him the torture instruments under the church. And after he saw the torch instrument, he came back up, and then he he's had a change of heart, and he, he, he felt that some of his writings were not quite, quite right, and the sun did, in fact, revolve around the earth. But that is the type of, he was very lonely. But if you stop and think about, there's a spacecraft called the Galileo. Why are we calling it Galileo? Because people recognize this man's bravery, we recognize his, he was right. He was right. And uh, so that's our way of saluting him. It's unfortunate that he has to be, uh, to, to die, but he knew he was right all along. So you know, and I think the Kennedys and what they stood for, 
will stand the test of time. I, I don't think that that ignorance and bigotry and hateful hatred is uh, rule out. And in fact, it cannot rule out. Uh, the reason we, as a as a human, as a species, have been able to get where we are now is cooperation. If we were not able to communicate and cooperate with each other, we would have been extinct. We could have been picked off and killed. There was a time on Earth when we had only a few thousand humans on the whole Earth, a few thousand. Now we're in the billions. And I guarantee you that how we got from thousands, a few thousand to billions was not because we were hating and, and, and killing each other. Because we had enough, we were prey, uh, the animals preyed on us. Big cats uh, found us easy prey. We couldn't outrun them. If we couldn't get up a tree and get away from them, we were, we were eaten. So we had to be cleverer than they were, and, and we had to communicate and, and work together. And I think the same thing goes on right now. If we do not understand that and we keep fighting and bickering over little stuff, we will find that, that we will be our worst enemies. We, will, we, we cannot survive that way. We have to work together whether or not you like it or not. We have to, we have to respect each other. And so I think that what Kennedy stood for is still going on right now. I don't think there's anything he's ever said that won't be true 100 years from now, 200 years from now. It will still be true. Same thing Abraham Lincoln. Same thing he said. And why it has to be that way is because he's basically, in, in one sentence, he's saying what you, he's put uh, himself in your place and he's challenged you to see it from that vantage point, and then see it from his vantage point. And when you think that, and you understand what he's, what's going on there, you'll see why it has to be that way. Because if you are going to say, I'm going to hate gay people, say, and then you happen to have a person or a relative or cousin or son or whatever who happens to be gay, then what have you basically said? If you hate, them, you hate them. And you can say, well, uh, I've always loved him. So right there you have a, 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 an incongruent type way of, of rationalization. That won't work. You have to say, okay, if that's the case, then the other people may be just like my son or my nephew or whatever, and I can't hate them either. It's the same way about uh, what I think is good about having all cultures to mingle and interact in a society whether it's being university, whatever. I think that's very good and it's wholesome because it basically allows you to dispel some of the preconceived notions that you may have. If you don't ever interact with someone of a different ethnic group, you will always assume that your bigotries and your hatreds are true. Well, if you go and you see a person who gets tired just like you, working on a job just like you, and he goes home to his wife and he calls on the cellular telephone, and he does the same thing you do, or he loves his children, and you see him kiss him and hold his children, then it wouldn't take very long for you to realize that my ideas and my concepts are not accurate. And uh, you, can, you can spend a lot of wasteful time trying to make something, to formulate it in your own mind, to make it just has to be this way. And of course, that's foolish, because you always are going to, because it's not that way in the first place. It never has been that way. You're trying to take something that's not real and turn it into reality, and reality just keeps knocking on the door saying, here I am, here I am. So for you to, to accept it and really feel that that's the way it is, is for you to be insane. Because that's the only way you can, you, can, you can bring all of this together. You cannot stand in the rain and keep convincing yourself that you're dry. I mean, eventually the water will be high enough that you'll be not just in a, a puddle, you'll be in a river, floating down the river. And, and maybe at your last gasp of air, you'll be sticking your head up saying, it's not raining. Well, by that time, it's foolish and it doesn't matter anymore. And I think this is the way uh, what's coming about now in our society is that way too. You'll have some people who will, the last statement will be segregation forever or uh, so and so and so and so. And that's well and good, but when you have uh, people in our armed services who are all different ethnic groups, people who are on the Supreme Court, people who are in our Senate and our Congress and our schools, our school teachers and all, eventually you have to say, well, you know, 
maybe I was wrong. And maybe it's because I have been looking at life from the wrong end of a telescope. Rather than seeing far away, I turn the telescope around and I'm looking at just a little minuscule part of everything I'm looking at. And if you want to really see everything, go and visit other cultures. Throw the telescope away and visit and interact with as many people as you can and you'll see that they all bleed like you bleed. They all cry when their loved ones die. They love their babies like you love your children. And, they, and, and then you say, okay, well, they wear a turban and I don't wear a turban. Well, back in the 50s and 40s, we wore hats. Now we don't hardly wear a hat. So what? I mean, if that's going to change you, that's nothing. That's nothing. I, I feel that the... I, I know the stories have been told about what's happened uh, and what Kennedy is supposed to have done this and supposed to have done that. And, and what's interesting to me is that all of that is always put in its proper perspective. In time, it's always forgotten. And uh, it's like uh, from Shakespeare, there's, there's a uh, statement in Julius Caesar uh, said, the evil that men do, the evil that men do live after them. The good is often interred in their bones. And he's saying it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a negative sense, but I think in a large way that's true. People want to dwell on the negative of stuff. Uh, if you go at Christmas time, and uh, back in the 50s and 60s, you'd have some uh, corner evangelists preaching at Christmas time, and they'll be saying how they had uh, such a hard time, and they were adulterers, and they were uh, drinkers, and they did this, and they did that and they have all type of people around them. But then the minute they say, but I saw the light and I have salvation, now I am doing that. And then people start peeling away. They start to leave it. They don't want to hear good stuff. They want to hear all of the, the bad things that you've done. That's that nature. They, they, they want to gawk and, and say, okay, you are not as good as I am because you've done these things. And that makes them feel good. And I think it's, I think it's healthy if you feel good if you're able to see a person doing good things. So I think a lot of times the people are making negative things about the Kennedys and all, it's of course to sell books and to make money, but it also is, if you look maybe in their life, you will see not even a shadow of the Kennedys' life. It's, it's not even a shadow. They, they have been so busy on the sidelines picking at life go by that they've allowed life to go by. And the Kennedys are busy leading and living life. That's what John Kennedy was about. He, he, was, you know, he wasn't going to stand on the sideline pointing fingers at different people. He was so busy trying to, to make a difference that, that uh, he wasn't going to be just a spectator. And I think that if we can, as a people, uh, kind of follow most of what he was trying to, to, to have us to do, and I go back to what I said initially, was basically to be a, a good a people as we can be. He wasn't going to settle. He's doing the same thing my parents did. He, my, my parents were not going to let you gravitate to the least common denominator. They were going to ask heroic things out of you. And in the 50s and 60s, I keep going back to that because that's what, that was a time when the comic book before TVs came out, we, we, comic books were our heroes. We saw our heroes in comic books. Superman, Batman. Uh, we, they, did, they did good things. And that may sound corny, but they did do good things. And I think it's that corniness that allowed those guys to go over to World War II uh, in harm's way like they were and do what they had to do. They were, if you were cynical and thinking that all life was bad and there's no good, they couldn't have done that. They couldn't have paid that type of price. But they went over there saying that good is the right way to do. And this is not right. This man's killing all these people. And, he, and we're going to be next, and they're not going to land on America and so on, so we're going to stop it right now. And that's what happened. But uh, and I, don't, I don't think that what the Kennedys are about any different than that. All they want to do is just let, I think, everybody uh, sure in that. And if you stop and look at it from just an objective way, stand outside of all of this and just look at it from a very objective way, it has to be that way, simply because uh, you cannot make it any other way. If left alone, you cannot say, go and fight and die for your country, and then your loved ones cannot go into this movie theater, or they can't go into this shopping center because of their color. Then you say, okay, if that's the case, then I don't want to go 
and get myself in harm's way if that's going to be that way. I shouldn't pay taxes. If I can't go to the school where my taxes are helping to support, why should I pay taxes? Why should I pay taxes for, for, uh, for roads if I'm going to go ahead and try to buy a car and a person is going to discriminate against me because I am female or because I'm a, a, a minority ethnic group? Well, I don't need the roads if I can't buy a car. Why am I going to buy a house if I can't get the job and my credentials are okay to get a job? So I, I think it all evens out. Have you ever uh, gone down to the Kennedy Memorial? Yes. Yes. Did you go down there when they first put it up? Or? I went down there about 10 years ago. And uh, I walked through with my children and, and uh, showed them different things and told them some things about uh, John Kennedy and the person I remembered. Uh, I, I guess in a way those things and memories are hurtful to me and it's like going by Dede Plaza. I don't, I would not, I, I don't choose to remember hurtful things. I like to forget hurtful things. And it's like uh, in talking to my brother sometime about uh, Vietnam. I didn't go to Vietnam, uh, but I have the two brothers that went there. You ever start talking about Vietnam to them, they don't talk very much about Vietnam. And I understand why. When I was at Walter Reed and seeing some of my young guys come back who were younger than I were with no legs and uh, or paralyzed or one eye or no eyes and these guys were like 19, and to, to realize they went over there and, and, and gotten themselves in this amount of uh, hurt, uh, I think the, the, the Kennedy Museum and all, I think people who were more likely to visit it and just and keep visiting are people who were not there, or who, it's, it's, it's all just history, like they read in a book. Well, it's not history to me. I mean, I lived it. It's like, it's like uh, my parents when they passed. Uh, I can't look at a picture of them without uh, still feeling the hurt from them, because that was my own flesh and blood. I live with them. They, they, we, we enjoyed each other. They loved me. I loved them, and now they're gone. And the Kennedy assassination, I look at the same way. There was a lot. Uh, I was 18 years old, and Kennedy came on the on the scene. Well, he, he came on the scene as a congressman, a little lot younger than that. But when he came out and uh, was inaugurated. I was 18 years old going off to college, and uh, I was seeing a lot. Yes. Uh, no, I'll, I'll get the car. Yes. I'll be out of here in a little while. They, they close at 6. Okay, what were you? Um, well, so you went, took you a while before you went down to the Kennedy Memorial. Yeah, it. And you still not, you never went to the museum? No, I went to the, I went to the museum. You went to the museum? That's, that's what I meant, about 10 years ago. Oh, I, but the memorial, you know, over on Market Street that they had built in 71. Mm. No, the, 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 the memorial was in 71, and that's over on Market. No, I'm, I'm yeah. going to say the, the museum up on the uh, east. The sixth floor, yeah. So, yeah, 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 that's why. I haven't been to the other one. I just went up on the sixth floor museum. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't... Even when I'm looking in magazines, it's... They show pictures of that. I pass the pictures. I just thumb through the pictures. I don't. I don't dwell it and try to uh, look at them or spend any time on them, because it's just it's it's a, it's like a wound that is healed over and just keep ripping a scab off to rebleed and heal all over again. I'd rather just I can't change it, I, and I don't. I don't want to, and especially now when I see the. Uh, uh, the negative things being said, I just think the whole thing has been so unfair for so long that I just, 
I guess in a way it's like uh, when my parents uh, passed and someone wanted to know whether or not to have an open casket or a closed casket, and I just chose to, said uh, my father was very proud. He, he probably would not want an open casket. He probably wants, he wants us to probably have just a closed casket and remember him as he was. And I kind of think this is similar to what I'm saying about the Kennedy, uh, the, the museum and the, the, the notoriety and all associated with that. I, it's good to, to know it's there and go through, but I don't know if I will ever go there year after year after year. And, and I don't think it's healthy for me to, to do that, knowing, uh, knowing some of the things that, that I saw at that time. It's the same way that uh, it's similar to when I go to Denton. Uh, when I was there in the 60s, um, African Americans weren't allowed to live on campus, and I was stayed in uh, the Blackwater town. I was walking two miles to campus. And half of that way was on gravel road. So I used to walk holes in my shoes, and I then put cardboard in the holes because I didn't want to tell my parents that I needed new shoes. It, it doesn't take long at all to walk a hole in shoes walking on gravel. Uh, there was a uh, philosophy professor at North Texas that saw us walking in the snow, and he he was over in the black part of town to pick up his housekeeper, and he asked us where we were going, and I told him we were going to school, and he said, yeah, I have to go to, all the way to, to, to North Texas and this. He said, why don't you stay on campus? So I told him, because we, we're not allowed to stay on campus. And so he just, I could tell the expression on his face, he was immediately so angry. He, he, he just gritted his jaw like he's saying, this is so stupid. He was just very angry. And he told us that we stayed in his housekeeper's back room. Uh, when he came to pick her up, he would pick us up too. And he took us over to his house where he dropped his housekeeper off. And then from there, he drove on to the campus. And he did that through the winters. Because uh, he just couldn't see us walking and uh, sleet and snow all up half sometimes to our knees almost and we walk in the street. And now when I go to Denton, I very seldom go to the back part of town or where I, the garage apartment is still there that I used to stay in. But it is very difficult for me to go and see that without, uh, and, and keep a dry eye because I still remember dealing with that and I feel sorry for who I was at the time when I had to deal with it because I was just a teenager. I was just 18 years old. And now, as a grown man, as a doctor, and, and done a lot of things and been all over the world, I could deal with it a whole lot better, but I always salute myself as an 18-year-old for dealing with it because it, it, that type of stuff could not nearly break me as a 30 or 40-year-old man or even in my 20s. But as an 18-year-old, that's when it could break you because you don't have a lot to base your courage on. You I mean, it's just high school and throwing the papers and that's it. And based on that and what your parents had to give you, I had to take that with me to face anything out there. And that was the first big deal. So when I faced it, it was like, I am not going to stop. And I had a lot of roommates to stop. They didn't want to deal with that. They, it, was, it was unfair at the end like it's unfair now. But I don't know if it was possible for me not to continue because to continue was to be the first stopping and to, and to, and to give up. And I, I knew enough about myself to say, once you stop and give up, it becomes easier and easier to rationalize and you continue to, to find a reason to not do. And I said, if, if I'm not able to do this, it will be because they'll find my body somewhere, but I won't stop. I mean, and it was impossible for me to stop. Uh, and this, that, that's hurtful. It's hurtful to me to see stuff about the Kennedys and besides me, it's hurtful to me the same way about that. They have, some memories are, are, are always there underneath the surface. And uh, sometimes it's best that they stay beneath the surface. And because otherwise, you could, I mean, I could dwell on some things that happen to the point where I'm not even functioning as, as well as I should be functioning because I'm, I'm, I'm still living in something that's past. And I dealt with it and I overcame it and it was time to move on. And I think this is what 
I think this is, this is quite of a strain for the Kennedy, uh, Kennedy family. When they answer, how can they over, how can they deal with so much uh, anguish and so much catastrophe and still go on? Is because I think they deal with it and love the people who are gone, pass it, and then they, they go on about what the next thing. They can't dwell on it; otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do anything. Were you uh, living in Dallas at the time that Oliver Stone came here to film this, do his film? No, I was. Uh, I think I was in in D.C. or Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. I don't imagine you saw that film if you. Uh, No, I saw the film. I I have always had some questions about the assassination, uh, but again, you have to sometimes take out when the person has a secondary game and motives. Uh, sometimes that will drive books and movies and this thing and and. Uh, some of the autopsy photos, I bought the book that had the, the, the autopsy photos in it when they had that out, and I looked at some of those, and some of the things they were discussing in that, I think, were secondary to uh, what happened at autopsy, and they were saying that this was this and that. Thing. After someone has had a performed autopsy, it's very difficult to go back and say exactly what went on, and I think some of the explanations are very difficult to go back and say. The reason I have some doubts about a lot of this is the fact that uh, there, I'm not certain that Lee Harvey Oswald by himself could have accomplished quite as much as he as he did, and uh, I'm not certain that a motive for it has ever been real straightforward. In fact, I think probably the Soviet Union may have more of an idea exactly what happened than anybody, because if he was an agent or whatever, or if he was not. It was to their advantage to find out who actually did. Since he was lived in Russia, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Soviet Union did their own investigation and tried to say, well, you know, is this man a, a, a wild cowboy that y'all sent back there to kill President Kennedy? Or wait, what's going on here? And I'm sure they had their own investigation. I'll bet you they came to a conclusion that he either was a, a cowboy sent over to do this or whether or not he was not even theirs. And uh, even so, the connection with the Soviet Union, I've always wondered, so what? I mean, wh what would the Soviet Union have to gain by, uh, by the assassination? I've often myself have felt uh, Kennedy's, uh, Oswald's role in Cuba may have had more to do, it may be a little closer to home, and I've often wondered whether or not uh, the reason the Cubans are kept at arm's length and why we're still... Uh, well, some of the countries that were in the Soviet Union and we actually went to war with, we reach out an olive branch to them quicker than Cuba, say the uh, North Vietnamese. I mean, we've never fought the Cuba, the little Bay of Pig fiasco, but, but we, we were talking with North Vietnamese quicker than Cubans, and I've always thought that was interesting. And when I stopped and said, well, what is it? I mean, yeah, Castro is of no threat to us, Castro, uh, but it seemed to be some under pin animosity that this country has against Cuba that's far above and above the, beyond what it should be for this little island nation. And I've often wondered whether or not we have knowledge to, to tie Cuba with this because uh, it's no you know, secret that attempts were made on Castro's life. And uh, so I still have to put it in, what was the why? Yeah, he did it, but why did he do it? And that's the thing that I don't think anyone's ever come to the surface for. I, there's no doubt. I, I think uh, Lee Harvey Oswald definitely killed him. Uh, he did, uh, Tippett, this whole thing, that uh, the, the, the gun being found, uh, him uh, having the gun uh, come into a mail order and prove that he bought the gun, that's the same gun. Uh, he worked at the scuba department. I mean, I mean, all of the information say he did it, but nothing says why he did it, and I'm often... One of, you know, what is going on behind that? That's the only thing that bothers me about it. It's never been that Lee Harvey Oswald didn't assassinate Kennedy, but why he did was something different. I'm not certain the Soviet Union, uh, this does not seem like the Soviet Union would have anything to gain by that. That's crazy, especially since uh, we were threatening them with nuclear war if, we didn't, if they didn't get the missiles out of Cuba. Then if they wanted to really rumble, 
why didn't they rumble with us then? Why would they go and risk all our nuclear war by having some person who's not really mentally stable to do this? I don't think the Soviet Union as a power as it was would have this man representing them as an assassin. They have their assassin, but I don't think it would be this guy. So they're so easily caught and so easily traced back to certain things. But Cuba's different. I wonder whether or not the Cubans wouldn't have used him to do something like this. And you know, I, I don't know if anybody will ever know that. And I'm just speculating because I'm saying it has to be a reason. And and I and I, I just I, I often wondered whether or not Lee Harvey Oswald's uh, stay in Cuba had more to do with Kennedy's assassination than his stay in Russia because uh, we tried to kill Castro. Do you, um, but what do you think of the people like Stone who try to suggest that our own government and, or that Lyndon Johnson, or those kinds of people are involved? Uh, we are mavericks in this state, but we're not crazy. And uh, Lyndon Johnson is, is no, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson is very, very bright, was a very, very bright man. Now he came across as is back homey and country, but Lyndon Johnson's been a school teacher and he, he knew uh, Senate very well. I don't think that Lyndon Johnson would even uh, ascribe to that. I think Lyndon Johnson would have been president regardless of, uh, of Kennedy's house. Eventually, Lyndon Johnson would have been president. And I don't think Lyndon Johnson, uh, I, I, think, I think it's an insult to even suggest that he would do that. Lyndon Johnson is just pure blood Texan and as American as I am. And I don't think it's any American that would go and do something. Uh, yeah, there are some Americans that might do it, but these are misguided, very uh, uh, disturbed Americans. I don't think Lyndon Johnson is misguided and disturbed. Lyndon Johnson has his own problem, but I don't, I don't think being uh, a traitor was one of them. So and, you don't think the kind of people who would rise in government are the kind of people who could do something like that? kind of people that would be effective leaders in the society couldn't resort to something like that? I just don't believe that. I mean, you know, I, I just don't believe it. I think for things that for Lyndon Johnson to stand for and some of the things that I know about what he has done, that is completely uh, uh, not in keeping with what who, who, who he is. Now, uh, I don't know, but I'm saying based on what my best scenario would be, I don't see how that could be. Like there's certain things I could expect certain people to do because I think they're ruthless enough and they don't care enough about other people to matter one way or the other. But I don't think Lyndon Johnson, uh, I think Lyndon Johnson, uh, I'm going to have to, uh, I think Lyndon Johnson was a, a person, a very powerful person, and he may have had some insecurities by being from uh, Texas, and uh, he still had the Texas twang, and he may have felt that the Easterners would try to look down on him. All those are true. Those are probably the case. But I think being a Texan, he also felt he was big and bad enough to stand on his own two feet and not have to kill someone. Lyndon Johnson strikes me as somebody more like to haul up and hit you in the face than to, than to sneak and hire somebody to kill you. I, I don't think he hide behind uh, to, to tell you how he felt. I think he'd come right up and tell you how he felt. Just to, I'll just ask you, what do you think the future is for Dealey Plaza. Do you think the people are going to still continue to be drawn there and be interested? Yeah, I think I think there would be people. Years, hundred years. I think there will always be an interest in Dealey Plaza simply because of history uh, from other countries. I, when I pass it, sometimes you see uh, people from Japan and other people taking pictures. They are there will always be that. But I like going to see the Mona Lisa. A uh, hundred years from now, I hope that people will choose to get a book and read and see who Kennedy was and not just uh, take a snapshot and, and go on through. Because there was a lot that was going on, a lot that they interrupted by killing him. And uh, they need to find out what he stood for. That's, that's what is important about that. If you want to remember John Kennedy, remember what his thoughts were and what he was trying to do. You don't have to finish the race all the time. If you, if you were in the race and you give it in 110%, that's good enough. When people see the courage that you put forth, especially if you are running a race uh, in the rain or you're running a race with, with uh, weights on your feet. And I think that's what the Kennedy family is all about anyway. It's just 
uh, it's more the courage in what they're doing. I'm not concerned about uh, him being reelected for the second term. He was good enough for those three years he was there for me, because he's he's I think he's outshone a whole lot of other people who who who've been there a lot longer. Do you think Gary Plaza will always be remembered for Kennedy now? Or? I, I do. I think David Plaza will probably always be associated with Kennedy. And last thing, have you continued to be a supporter of Democrats, or are you not affiliated? Well, I, I would rather not choose to suggest my uh, political leanings, but uh, I think that anyone could probably surmise what political party I would be associated with, because I'm uh, when Lyndon Johnson became uh, president and pushed the civil rights movement, uh, Texas was mainly Democrat. Uh, it became mainly Republican as a response to what he was trying to do. He was trying to make things fair, and a number of the people who left the Democratic Party went to Republican. And and so why would I be in favor of of, of uh, someone who whose party uh, became a larger party simply because they didn't want others or they felt uncomfortable with other people being included in American pie, especially since every American was being drafted going off to uh, lose their life. So every, it should be fair to everybody. And as far as I'm concerned, even though uh, Lincoln is a, a Republican supporter of, of Lincoln, uh, here recently, I think if a person is going to be, uh, have a chance and always, you're going to look at the strength of something. You want to look at the weaknesses of it. Say, if I were crippled, uh, black, gay, female, who would include me in their party with open arms and say, it's okay, you have the right to anybody else? And, uh, and I think everybody knows what party that would be. Uh, you don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be uh, Anglo. And you don't have to be on any country club. The Democrats are a party of the people. And I think that... So I've always, uh, I have gotten a lot of uh, mailings from the Republican Party because they assume that as a position I would automatically be Republican. I'm not saying I'm Republican or Democrat, but I'm saying that's interesting and I, I, I understand that. But uh, I am a fair person and I have, a, I've lived in this country long enough to see enough to uh, affiliate myself with a party that not would just help people that look like me, but for anybody. A party that I would be for would be a party that uh, any person who needs a champion would not, uh, this party would not step on your neck, but maybe reach down and pick you up and brush you off and give you at least a chance. And I think that's, that speaks for itself which party that is. Thank you. Mm -hmm.